Welcome to this video on reproductive isolating mechanisms. Now in the first video of this series we looked at natural selection and we learnt about survival of the fittest. That is, the animals that are best adapted to their environment are the ones that are most likely to survive and therefore have offspring. So we saw the example of rabbits, of faster rabbits are more likely to survive when there's predators around. Then we built on this and said that this natural selection is about matching the animal to their environment in the best possible way. But if you have different environments, whether it's behavioral or geographic, you actually evolve differently. And therefore we learned there are two types of speciations or two types of evolution that evolves to different species. The first was allopatric speciation, so if you have a different origin, so you're physically in a different place. The second we learned about was sympatric speciation, so if you're in the same origin, but you still evolve differently. This video on reproductive isolating mechanisms is about understanding the reasons of why a single species might evolve into different species. So, the key thing you need to know for reproductive isolating mechanisms is the definition. A reproductive isolating mechanism is any factor that prevents two organisms from a different species from mating and reproducing fertile offspring. Because if two organisms from a different species cannot mate and produce offspring, they are a different species. And in this example, we're going to usually talk about two different species of dog, or two different species of fly, or two different species of fish, rather than elephants and mice, for example. So there are five different isolating mechanisms that we're going to talk about today. The first one is geographic. If you're in a physical different environment, you can isolate gene pools. So, for example, if there's oceans, or deserts, or islands, or mountain ranges, all of these things would separate one group from another group. And because they'll then have different environmental pressures, they'll evolve differently and can turn into different species from that point. So that's geographic separation. And this is allopatric speciation. So different environments, different geographies. Whereas the remaining four will be examples of sympatric speciation. So the next one we want to look at is temporal. And this refers to the timing of an activity. So reproduction doesn't overlap between two different species. So for example, if you've got two types of lizards, one was nocturnal and one was diurnal, so it was out during the day, they're never going to see each other, so they're not going to reproduce. Therefore, they develop differently. Or as another example, here we've got the western and the eastern spotted skunks. And they breed at different times of the year. So one is in autumn, the other is in late winter. So again, when one wants to breed, the other's not ready for it and vice versa. So therefore, they never end up crossbreeding. They'll evolve separately and therefore, they can turn into two different species. So this is temporal or the timing of activity. And almost always, that's going to refer to reproduction timing rather than any other kind of timing. The third we're going to look at is ecological. So this is different species occupy slightly different areas within the same overall geography. So for example, if we look at sticklebacks, now I know of at least eight different types of sticklebacks and they are all different species. And that's because they occupy different concentrations of salty water. So some like almost completely fresh water, whereas others will live in really heavily salty water. Now they don't cross over because they have different regions of saltiness that they all like but it is the same overall area of ocean that they want to live in. But because they never directly cross over, they're never going to breed together, therefore they're going to develop as different species of stickleback. The fourth we're going to look at is ethological. So these are behavioral differences and usually talk about how animals court together. So for example, if you have a male peacock who's ready to mate, they're trained innately to puff out their feathers, do a big display, and that's what a male peacock does then the female peacock is trained to respond to that. They notice the big feathers and think, oh, that looks nice, and then they'll get together. So that is an example of two peacocks having rituals that are specific to peacocks as a species. Therefore, they're much less likely to look for other birds or other species to mate with, because that's not how they do their mating rituals. So that's ethological or behavioral differences. So if you think about monkeys or birds or dogs or whatever, this might be a different mating call, which is still specific to each species. The final one we're going to look at is structural differences. Now these are the anatomical variations between a species. So for example, this could be flowers. Now flowers that are really open are usually only going to cross-pollinate with other open flowers. And that's because the pollinator, that's the butterfly that carries the pollen from one flower to another flower, can only physically get into open flowers. Whereas bees will pollinate a different type of flower because they can crawl right inside and get the pollen all over their bodies. But they'll cross-pollinate with other closed flowers that they need to crawl right into. 
Or for example, when you're talking about sex organs, there's a lock and key model, where sex organs of the male will fit cleanly into the sex organs of the female. So this is why you can have flies mating with flies and elephants mating with elephants, but more difficult to get an elephant mating with a fly. That's because of those physical differences which prevents reproduction. So in summary, what you need to know is the five different key ideas of reproductive isolating mechanisms. And remember, reproductive isolating mechanisms are any factor at all that prevents two different organisms from those different species from mating and producing offspring together. And if you can produce offspring, you're counted as the same species. If you can't produce offspring, you're a different species. Are the reasons that different species evolve over time and can no longer produce fertile offspring. So the five we looked at were number one, geographic, if you're in a different physical environment, and this refers to allopatric speciation. The remaining four refer to sympatric speciation. So those were temporal, that's if the timing of your reproduction doesn't occur, so that could be different seasons of the year or day-night differences of when you're wanting to reproduce. We also learned about ecological, so that's habitat differences. So this is where you occupy different areas of the same space. So we learned about the stickleback fish, which occupy different levels of saltiness in the water. We also learned about behavioral differences, and this is one you can almost always talk about in your exam answers, and that's different courting rituals that are specific to each species, so whether that's a mating call or whether that's a certain different display that people actually do when they're wanting to mate. And the final is structural or anatomical differences. If you're physically a different shape, it makes it different to reproduce in a different kind of way. And in most cases, it just flat out prevents reproduction at all. That's structural differences. So those are the five different factors which are reproductive isolating mechanisms. The five factors that prevent two different organisms from two different species from mating and producing fertile offspring. Let's look at a question now. In this question, we're looking at the coyote, the jackal, and the dingo. So they're all closely related species that belong to the dog family. And if we look at the jackal a little bit more closely, there's actually three distinct species of jackal. So there's the side striped jackal, number one, the golden jackal, number two, and the black back jackal, number three. So they all overlap in the Serengeti area of Eastern Africa. So these animals, they're highly territorial, but they just simply ignore the other jackal species, and there's no interbreeding that takes place at all. That means they must be different species. Whereas if we jump back to these three original types rather than the three types of jackal, we can say that the coyote, the jackal, and the dingo have all been known to interbreed with common domestic dogs, and they do produce fertile offspring. So in this case, they're not truly different species because they can all interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So what we need to do is compare and contrast how these different species, although being closely related, have actually evolved from a common ancestor. And there's three different points we're going to cover. So let's start with number one, where we have to describe the term reproductive isolating mechanism. So hopefully we will have learned the definition and we can write that down. We can say that reproductive isolating mechanisms are any factor that prevents two organisms from different species from mating and producing fertile offspring. So we know what that is. And we can add to that and say that there are many different types of isolating mechanisms, and we learnt five of them, so I'd recommend listing them just to show you really know what you're talking about. The geographical, temporal, which is timing, ecological, which is the niche that you're holding, ethological, which is the behavioural ones, and structural, which is the anatomical differences. So that's what reproductive isolating mechanisms actually are. Then we can go on to actually explain how these species in the question, the coyote, the three different types of jackal, and the dingo, all become reproductively isolated. So we can say that the three distinct species of jackal, if we focus in on the jackals first, all developed in an overlapping area of Africa, it says in the Serengeti area. So this is called sympatric speciation. So because speciation occurred in the same geographic area, that means that different isolating mechanisms would have allowed speciation to occur. And we're talking about different to the geographical area because we know they were in the same geographic area. So to break that down, we can talk about what those other four factors might have been. So we can say it could have been behavioral differences or ethological differences, such as different mating calls. Or they could have been different structural or anatomical differences, such as the actual color of the jackal. So there's the side stripe versus the golden color versus the black color. So these are all behavioral differences where side striped jackals, for example, may be more likely to reproduce with other side striped jackals, or golden jackals more likely to reproduce with other golden jackals, and so on. And over time, these behavioral differences would have led to the formation of completely new species. 
So this is us talking about the different types of jackals, but actually we can also talk about the coyote, jackal, and dingo differences as well. So in this case, we can say that different reproductive isolating mechanisms would have resulted in these three, the coyote, the jackal, and the dingo, becoming reproductively isolated. And if you know anything about a dingo, you know that they live in Australia, whereas these guys are talking about Africa here with the jackals. So we can say there's geographical isolation. Dingoes become geographically isolated. And if you want to go really deep and you know about this, you could say that's actually when Australia, the mainland, separated from Gondwana many, many years ago when the earth was still kind of evolving and taking shape. We could also say that the coyote may have been geographically isolated as well, even if it was in Africa. And that could have been for other things like mountains or deserts or other physical barriers that are there. And all of these differences are really down to natural selection, which is they have a different environment, therefore they're going to evolve to suit that environment. So we can add that in and say each of these groups would have been subjected to those different selection pressures. So that over time, different alleles, different phenotypes, different characteristics were all selected for. And eventually, this led to speciation or creation of a new species. And this is an example of allopatric speciation, which is when they're in different geographical areas. Now, finally, we need to consider the selection pressure that led to speciation in all of these cases and whether it actually is true speciation. So first of all, selection pressures are any environmental factor. So this could be the climate, which is like the heat, the rain, whatever's going on, the food that's around. All of those different factors which contribute to an animal surviving. So the individual animals that are most suited to survive, they're the ones that are selected for because the other ones die. Therefore, they're the most likely ones to reproduce. They pass on their genes to the next generation. So all we're doing here is describing natural selection. So if you can come up with some explanation for natural selection and throw in that word there, you're doing well. That's what selection pressures is all about. The next thing we want to do is identify what a species actually is. Now we know it's a group of individuals that can reproduce and can create fertile offspring. That's the whole definition of a species. So therefore, the coyote, the jackal, and the dingo have all been known to interbreed with the common domestic dog, and they can produce fertile offspring. So this means that technically they're actually all members of the same species. So it's not a true example of speciation, but it would often be referred to that during the question. So this is everything you need to know and how you answer a question on reproductive isolating mechanisms.